Well, thank you both for those kind of introductions, and I'm, I'm happy that we could find a time where I could uh, come share some things and talk with you all. So um, I'll structure my talk in sort of two parts. The first one is um, the uptake of active learning, and, and then the second part focusing on some departmental change work. Um, so first one said, like, well, what we know, I said the research is, is getting pretty robust now in terms of the effects of, of the of active learning or inquiry learning on student um, progress. So the a really important study came out in 2014, where there's a meta analysis of 225 studies that compared student achievement in a range of undergraduate STEM courses. So not just mathematics, but also physics, chemistry, biology, and found that students in a lecture oriented class were 1.5 times more likely to fail than students in an inquiry or active learning classroom. Um, and they defined active learning very broadly. So it wasn't a very, you know, it wasn't sort of like a one size fits all. It was a, it was a broad meaning. The authors um, in that report made a, I think, quite provocative statement near the end of the study. They said, um, had this been a medical experiment, it would have been pulled because of um, moral issues. Like you can't, you can't withhold this treatment from people now. We know so much about it. Um, so I, I take that for what it is. I think probably there's always room for lecture and a good consolidation of ideas, but there's definitely some um, added benefit for active or inquiry-oriented approaches. Um, Sandra Larson colleagues, they looked at four top research centers and the conjecture was, all right, well, maybe you can do active learning in institutions that value teaching and that's the primary role of instructors. And, it, and the, the conjecture was, what about at top research universities? And so um, these included um, University of Chicago, it included one of the UC campuses, University of Michigan, another one. Um, and, and so they did a comparison study, again, of, of traditionally taught courses um, paired with then inquiry-oriented courses. And, and they found that the inquiry-based learning um, courses had significant positive outcomes, especially for women and students with prior um, lower math achievement and had no negative consequences on students of high achieving. So again, sort of a, a, a range of studies here, which is a point to the benefits. And uh, just a couple of years ago, Theobald and colleagues followed up on the Freeman study, and they did a regression analysis of 15 studies, and they were really looking at, at historically uh, underrepresented students, um, and they found that the active learning compared to traditional learning, that on average, active learning reduced achievement gaps um, and examination scores by, by a third and narrowed gaps by passing rates by 45%. Um, so with that said, though, I think there are studies which are pointing to the caution that active learning is not a guarantee of equitable outcomes. So, for example, as we open up our classrooms and have student voice more prominent, we have to be very cautious about whose voice gets gets heard, um, whose voice doesn't get heard, who, whose voice is getting privileged. And so those are really um, issues around equity and inclusion that have to be on our forefront all the time. So um, another thing that we know is um, as I alluded to the study of uh, characteristics of successful programs in college calculus, and we had done a national study of, of universities, and we had identified um, a number of 20-some uh, institutions that were more successful than their counterpart institutions. And success here we had measured by, of course, grades, um, but also effective issues around interest, enjoyment, and confidence in mathematics. Um, one of the things that we identified in the survey is that that calculus is really effective at devastating student confidence. And so these successful institutions were ones that they didn't raise student interest in, in enjoyment, but they didn't devastate it. They kind of kept it kept it stable. So that was a, a, a measure of success of, 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 of not um, crushing students' <laughs> ability and interest in mathematics. And, and one of the features of these successful programs was the use of active learning. And so I think this is that's another um, is an in-depth case study analysis where um, active learning is supporting a whole range of other factors which are contributing to student success. So I want to drill down a little bit into how how pervasive or widespread active learning is in undergraduate um, mathematics. We were able to do a, a follow-up study to the characteristics of successful programs in college calculus um, called Progress Through Calculus. And one of the things that we did is a census survey of all math departments that offer a graduate degree in mathematics. Um, and there's like some 330 some uh, math departments that offer either masters or PhD in mathematics. And we chose that as our as our data set because that's the majority of that, those those are 
the, the kinds of institutions that are producing the majority of STEM graduates. Of course, community colleges and four-year institutions are important components of preparing students to be in a STEM field. Um, but as researchers, you have to sort of carve your data set out somewhere. And so this was a reasonable uh, place for us to do, do the work. Um, I was really, we, we, were, we were just thrilled by the response rate. Um, at the PhD level granting institutions, we had a 75% response rate. Um, overall, 67.6. That's just unheard of in survey world. And this was not a five minute survey. This was at least a 30, 40 minute survey. Um, it had to involve multiple people to collect data. You can see the kind of information that we, we requested. It was, it was a big ask. And we were fortunate that David Brousseau, who, who was on the project, and at the time he was the president of the MAA. And so we had a little bit of leverage power through uh, David Brousseau and that, that I think helped. But I also think what helped is that math departments across the country are eager to learn more and be part of change efforts. And so I think this reflects a, uh, a, a trend upward in um, our national math department's interest in, in, in mathematics education research and what they can do to be more successful themselves. So on this survey, one of the things that we asked them was to rank um, rank for themselves how important the seven characteristics of successful programs are and then how successful they are in carrying out that particular feature. So I want to share with you a little bit of, of results from that particular question on the census survey. Um, and I'd like you to make a prediction and I'll, and I'll try to ask you to put this in the chat in a moment. So for, for um, the characteristics here, uh, what percent of math departments reported that the use of student-centered pedagogies, that's active learning, is very important for student success in the pre-calculus through calculus sequence? So that's your first number. And then the second number I want you to put in the chat is what percent of math departments reported that they're very successful in implementing student-centered strategies in pre-calculus through calculus? So um, if you would, please go ahead and put in the chat and, and go ahead and, and press enter when you got that. Okay, we've got an 85, 25, 50, 20, 60, 30, 50, 15. Awesome. Okay, so let me let me share with you the, the survey results. Um, we actually found that 44% of departments said that active learning was very important uh, for student success and pre-calculus. And, but only 14% reported being very successful. So the dark bar in the bottom, that's the very, they also could say, they also could ask, say it's somewhat important or not important. Um, so interestingly, we had, you know, just very few people say it's not important, but a, a whole slew of people said it's also somewhat important. So I, I've been at this math ed research for 25 years now. And to me, having 44% of the departments say active learning is very important was astounding. Because 10 years ago, honestly, if you talk about active learning in a math department, you get sort of glazed faces. Like, what are you talking about, active learning? What, what, you, what? So 44% for me, sort of having been around for a while is pretty impressive. Um, I think if you're a, a current sort of newcomer to the field and you've been, you've been, you've been following the trends, you're like, oh, that's disappointing. Um, but but I, I think in, in context of, of our last couple of decades, it's pretty good. Um, and I think it's also very telling that only 14% of departments said they're very successful. So this, again, speaks to the, I think, a raising awareness by math departments of the value of active learning, but also recognition of like, gosh, we don't really know how to do this. And that makes sense, though, because as, as, as mathematicians, we're not trained in pedagogy. So we have to sort of pick it up on the side. Um, and this is, I think, where professional societies are really stepping up, the MAA, the AMS, um, supporting professional development efforts and, and really trying to get um, the next generation of mathematicians on board. I think Project Next is a great example of that. Um, Amatic, the two-year colleges also has similar programs. So I, I see sort of a very positive upward trend for, for our country. I also wanted to share the results on the other seven characteristics of successful programs. And so again, the black bars um, on the left-hand side is very important. And then the one next to it is how successful are you? Um, and you can see placement is a place where people are having huge problems. So everyone recognizes the extreme importance of getting students in the right course, but also recognizing that, that we're not very good at doing that. Um, the, the, one, the one feature that people felt they were actually more successful than it was 
important was uniform course components. So for example, you have the same textbook, you're sharing the same syllabus, maybe you have the same web work exercises. You know, that makes sense because those are pretty easy to implement. They don't require a lot of, of, of human effort and you can kind of get those set up. Um, um, I think the use of local data is also interesting that that people are recognizing that 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 using data to make grounded decisions is is an important part of of monitoring themselves in progress. But they're also again like how do we get that data? I don't know how when I get that data, I know how to analyze it. So again, areas of of, of need for the mathematics community that, that I think professional societies can can help out with. I want to also talk to you a little bit about a, a study that was recently completed by. Nana Apkarian, former doctoral student of mine, and a bunch of colleagues um, from Western Michigan, and they did a they did a survey of of the uptake of active learning or research based instructional strategies in both um, undergraduate mathematics, in particular calculus, but also in chemistry and physics, and compared across those. Um, I want to share with you just a couple of results of of their study that I think are relevant for our active learning discussion here. Um, part of what they did was they set out to test various conjectures about why or why people do not use active learning. I mean, there's a whole range of kind of folk theories out there like, well, you can't do active learning if you're at a R1 institution, or you can't do active learning if you've never actually had some experience yourself, or people have lots of excuses why we don't do active learning. And so they were testing some out these some of these conjectures. Um, so just as a background, they found that that in their survey, and this is a mathematics now, is that still lecture is the most dominant form of pedagogy. So we see that um, uh, around 50% of all classes, rent, that's, the, that's the percentage of class time spent lecturing. Um, and this was fairly comparable to physics and chemistry. Physics was a little bit um, better in terms of the amount of active learning going on. So the physics community seems to be lecturing less than the mathematics community, but not significantly that so. Um, all right, so again, I want to engage you in a little, little sort of thought experiment, and I want you to put in the in the chat for each of these sort of factors that we might think are are affecting people's use or non-use, whether you think it's real, somewhat real, slightly real, or not real. So you're going to put one of those four in the chat for, for each of the different factors, both contextual and individual. All right, so um, the first conjecture is that okay, you can't use active learning in, in using large class sizes. Do people report that as a real factor? So um, go ahead, put in the chat, real, uh, somewhat real, not real, somewhat not real. So I got a not real in there. All right, so their survey found that that was somewhat real of a factor. So they found that lecture is higher in, in the classrooms with the largest size. Um, but some research based instructional strategies are being used in large class sizes, um, but it does require a selection. You can't you can't do some of those active learning strategies in large class size, but you can do others ones. So there's a need for guidance on the kinds of, of pedagogical practices that can be used in large class sizes. So the next factor is uh, classroom setup. So active learning research based instructional strategies are more likely to be used in special classes, classes that are equipped with say tables and whiteboards all around. So is that do you think is a real somewhat real, uh, somewhat not real or not real? Yeah, that's real. That is that is absolutely real. Um, so the, the the significance here is is important for our administrators to keep investing in classrooms that facilitate active learning. So we've got to be sharing these results with our administrators. Like, look, if you want us to improve student success, we need facilities that help us do this. So I think that's a nice contribution of this particular outcome. Um, how about student evaluation of teaching? Um, the conjecture is that that student evaluations inhibit the use of research based instructional strategies. I mean, the, the, the folks like psychology is that like, well, I can't do active learning because I'm going to get bad student evaluations and then I won't get tenure or I won't get promoted. So real, somewhat real, somewhat not real or not real. I love the mathematicians here putting the acronyms SR. Very efficient. Love it. Yeah, this was a real factor they found. This is absolutely a real factor. So so number of faculty reporting that they're um, worried about using active learning because of the student evaluations. 
Um, and, I, and you know, if I look at the evaluations that San Diego State uses, they privilege lecture. The questions that students are asked are really privileging lecture. So we really need a, a, a overhaul of the kinds of evaluations that we're asking students. If we're valuing active learning, we need to value it in our student evaluations as well. So we need to have the student evaluations that are that are assessing and getting insight into, into how well active learning is being implemented in, in classrooms, or if it is at all. So um, some individual factors. So now there's a host of things you might conjecture to be the case of about individuals that may or may not uh, inhibit their use of or promote their use of active learning. So um, security. So I can't do active learning because I'm not tenured yet. So that's kind of like a folk theory. It's like, like, no, maybe I'll do active learning once I get tenured or I'm promoted to full professor. So real, somewhat real, not real. Okay, lots of reels, a somewhat real there. Turns out this is not real. This is not a real factor in the survey. Tenured instructors report using slightly less, but not significantly so than non-tenured faculty. There was not a significant difference in the, in the amount of active learning reported between uh, position status. Um, so it's completely reasonable to expect untenured instructors. However, I think this goes hand in hand with the previous results is that we have to make sure the student evaluations, especially for untenured faculty, are, are, are uh, addressing what we value in terms of pedagogy. Okay, conjecture. Um, highly researched active instructors do not use research-based instructional strategies. So if you're a top researcher in your field, an R1 institution, that's your jam, and you're not even thinking about using active learning. So real, somewhat real, slightly real, not real. Yeah, slightly real. So scholars with very high levels of research activity lecture a bit more, only 3%, so not significantly more. And, and hence, there's really no reason to assume that highly researched active instructors don't have time or aren't interested in using active learning. And in fact, the previous study that I cited of Sandra Larson and colleagues at the four R1 institutions are further evidence that, yeah, even at top research universities, active learning it is viable, possible, and is happening. And lastly, the conjecture is, well, prior exposure, those who have experienced active learning or research-based instructors will use it in their own teaching. Hmm. Real, not real, somewhat real. Oops. This is real. This is actually real. Experiences with research-based instruction as a student or as a student instructor um, um, decreases the use of lecture and increases the use of, of active learning. So I think this is super important for us right now who are having master's and doctoral programs because we're training the next generation of doctoral students. So I think it's incumbent upon us to provide experiences for them teaching and active learning strategies, professional development like that. So I think the onus is on us to help train the next generation because we're seeing that having experience as, as a young faculty member, as a graduate student, makes a difference when they get their own uh, classrooms. Okay, so um, benefits of research-based instructional strategies are well documented, but uptake still remains low. Um, why is this the case? What, you know, what can be done to change the culture of mathematics departments so that active learning is kind of the new normal? Um, and this is something I've been working on the last five plus years on some different NSF grants, and it's certainly a, a, a complicated story, and we're, we're learning a, a bit of about um, change strategies. Um, but what I want to do is not talk about the national data. I want to give a very personal account of our departmental institutional change at my own institution at San Diego State University. Um, so a little bit of institutional context. We are a um, fairly large institution, 30,000 students. We're a uh, Hispanic serving HSI. 84% um, of our undergraduates qualify for some type of financial aid. Um, we are not the most select um, university in the world, but we're also, you know, it's not an open door policy as well. So we get good students, um, um, and we also um, have a very small math department. So for a big university, only having a math department, which includes statistics and math educators, is small. Seventeen mathematicians. So this is this is um, something we've been working hard with our administrators to try to resolve, but we're we're not getting very far. <laughs> but anyway, so my point is that is that San Diego State is an institution much like those around the country. We have a diverse student body, um, not 
not entirely super selective and we're small in numbers, the mathematicians. Um, and so we started looking at our calculus program. This was seven years ago, five years ago. And um, we took as sort of a guiding set of principles, these characteristics of successful programs. Um, again, active learning being one of them. And if you're interested in reading more about this, you can download this free copy of the book um, at the MAA. So that's a free PDF you can download. All right. Um, so we took a hard look at our program, our calculus program, and we said, how, where do we rank in terms of our, our, all these characteristics of successful programs? So use of local data. Yep. Nope. We weren't looking at anything. Placement procedures. Yeah, not so much. We had a cramped room. Um, we had we had a sorry a paper and pencil uh, test that the answers were widely available um, and it never changed. So uniform course components zero. We had zero uniform. You could have three different instructors teaching Calc one and three different textbooks. It was the wild wild west. Regular instructor meetings. Yeah, only to complain. Use of active learning. Yeah, what's that? Uh, robust GTA training. More it's like here's your book and syllabus. Good luck. Um, in student academic support, they had a small room in the math department. So our before situation was pretty grim. But I'm really pleased to say that that after a significant investment of time and human resources, we've turned things around. And this is pre pandemic. So we're sort of recovering from the pandemic right now as everyone else is but um, used to data, we started collecting and analyzing the data and tracking how students are doing um, as they progress to the sequence. So for example, one thing we're finding is that students that get a C in pre-calculus, only 17% of them are successfully completing Calc 2. So there's something really sort of problematic about, about pre-calculus getting a C. The people who get an A or B seem to be doing fine, but the C in pre-calculus, all it's passing, it's not sufficient for at least our students. Uh, we've changed to Alex, and while Alex is not perfect, we are so happy with it. It's, it's really helping us place students into uh, um, a much more effective program. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had proctored Alex um, during pandemic. It was not proctored, and right now we're seeing the results of that. So uh, anybody who's moving to Alex, I would, I would definitely say you need to get a, a proctored environment. Um, uniform course components, we have many, many now, and I'll say more about that. Um, we're making some progress on instructor meetings. That's still a hard one for us to crack, but we're, we're making some progress. Um, active learning, really roll that out in discussion sections, and I'll tell you more about that. Um, big progress on our TA professional development program. And then we have a brand new facility in the library for, um, for uh, uh, student academic support. And that was part of, we tapped into the university strategic plan. So um, as I mentioned that it was the wild west, we didn't have a uniform textbook even. Um, and so this was a big change to the culture. If you were teaching calculus, the culture in the math department was that you could do whatever you want in terms of the textbook. I mean, of course there was a standard set of topics you needed to cover, but you could, you could use whatever textbook you wanted. Um, we had a we had a pretty extensive uh, department meeting and a debate over this, and we ended up um, a voting, and it was approved by the department that we would move toward having all these um, uniform components. And with this, we had a course coordinator because we didn't have any course coordinators before. I mean, you don't need a coordinator if it's the Wild West. So with a course coordinator, then they're taking responsibility for organization, bringing TAs together, trying to have some uh, faculty community around teaching. There's better horizontal coordination. That means across sections of the same course and vertical, meaning that from pre-calc to calc one and calc two. Um, and some instructor meetings now are beginning to engender a, a sense of community. Um, a, a premise that we had was that, however, faculty had to maintain pedagogical autonomy. Just because you're having coordination does not mean people are going to tell you how to teach. So that was that was a, 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 a non-negotiable for us is that that had to be part of about who we are as faculty members is that if I want to go and I want to do think pair shares or lots of small group work or I want to give many lectures that's that's up to me it's not going to be part of the coordination. Um, so active learning we were a bit cautious about making too aggressive a move because, as I said, our our starting spot was like active learning what's that those are glazed over um, and our solution was really to work with the discussion sections. Uh, we have large lectures with, we did have only one discussion section per week. Our uh, department chair learned that if we, if we change it to call it a lab, we can then increase it from one hour to two hours a week for discussion sections without changing the credit hours. So this sleight of hand doubled the number of contact hours in discussion section. And we then devoted one of those to active learning lab problems that we worked on um, over several summers developing. 
And we were able to reduce the number of students in these breakout sessions from 40 to 30. Um, and one of the things that seemed to happen now is that there was an up take of active learning to the lectures from the discussion sections. So many of our lecturers were saying, hey, this seems to be working well. Our students are pretty happy. And they said, we're also having a problem in lecture with attendance. And they said, well, why don't we start using clickers? And they started using clickers and they started using good questions for clickers. And so it's a sort of interesting phenomenon that like you start with sort of uh, uh, the discussion sections and then it kind of grows up into the, uh, the faculty members teaching the lectures. So um, GTA professional development, it, it really was a 100% turnaround. Um, we now have a two and a half, three day beginning of the academic year workshop um, where we introduce students to active learning, we practice, we talk about the rationale for it. Um, we also developed a three credit course for ongoing first year students. So if you're a first year graduate student, you have a three credit support course that takes you through the academic year. And that's, that's a something we took from the K through 12 literature. We already know that like a, a summer workshop for high school teachers is great, but if you don't have any follow-up during the academic year, forget it, it's, it's, it's information loss. So we want to make sure we weren't um, falling into that trap. So um, the Math Learning Center, what um, was phenomenal about that is that um, it's directed by one of our math ed faculty from the math department. And that wasn't the initial idea of the provost. The provost wanted to do an external search for a director of the Math and Stat Learning Center. And our department said, wait, 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 not so fast. This is really supporting our course sequences. We need to have one of our faculty members as directors so that there's a, there's a flow of communication and of ideas between the department who's teaching these courses and who's supporting them. And um, the our department chair was able to convince the provost to do that. Um, and there, again, pre-pandemic that TAs were having their office hours there. And even some of the faculty members had their office hours in the center. So how did we get started? How did we go from zero to 60? Um, what I think was, was super important is that, is that these, these changes were not mandated. They were discussed in the department and voted on and agreed upon. Um, and to jumpstart all of this, we formed a calculus task force. And that task force was made up of members who had diverse fears of influence and opinions. So we definitely had people on that task force which were um, very, encouraged about active learning and wanting to make changes and people who were quite sort of, hmm, I'm not sure about that. Um, so we didn't, we didn't uh, populate the task force with um, uh, people that were gonna have a singular vision. Um, and that would really serve our interest because then when we came to the department as a task force, people listened. They said like, okay, there's a bunch of reasonable people here that, that aren't all on the same camp and those are their proposals. Um, so that, that, was, that was a, a super important part, I think about how the changes came about in a more organic and uh, departmental way rather than as a top-down approach. Um, we also took a systems approach. We took the perspective that we're not gonna move this oil tanker if we just try to change one thing and then see what the effect is. We said, we're, we're, we're lacking all over the place. We gotta move the system. And so in blue on the outside, you'll see those are the seven characteristics of successful programs. And then in the pink circles, those are all the offices on campus that we had to organize with and coordinate with to make it happen where the change is at the math department. So if we take the math department as a unit of a change, which we do, you can't change though in isolation from the institution because you have to deal with the testing office, enrollment, advising, the provost office, um, yeah, so I think that's another important lesson that I would that I would that I would give people is that take a holistic systems approach to your change efforts. Um, and I just want to include with a, a couple of comments from Charles Henderson's work. Um, he's he's a, a physicist, a physics edge, a person who does um, really really good change um, research. And they've identified through a literature review um, ineffective and effective change strategies. So for, for departments that are interested in, in making some changes to their courses, I think these are some lessons learned from the literature. And I try to provide some lessons learned from my own personal experiences at San Diego State. Um, so ineffective change strategies are, are developing and testing best practice materials. I kind of like build it and they will come. Oh, if we just get a really good active learning textbook, it's going to change the way it's done. Not going to happen. That doesn't change things. And top-down policymakers, this, this doesn't work. We all know that. We're, we're, we're academics. We don't want to be told what to do. <laughs> um, but effective change strategies are aligned with and seek to change the beliefs of individuals involved. So if really thinking about those long-term beliefs, we've got to involve people in talking about why they think certain things are happening. Um, and it's got to be long-term intervention. It can't just be one semester. 
You can't just like, oh, we're going to try really hard in the spring and then take your hands away. It's not going to work. And then also they had the same um, finding that we did is take a, take a, a systems approach that your math department is part of a complex web within your university. Um, so you have to design a strategy that's compatible with that. Um, yeah, so I think with that, I will end and show you a lovely sunset at the beach in San Diego. There's, that's um, a picture where it's called Dog Beach. And so I often take my, my two dogs there um, in sunset time. So anyway, that's all I have for you today. And I'm, I'm happy to um, have a conversation. We can have some questions. Thanks, Chris. That was yes. a wonderful presentation. Uh, that's virtual clap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a question. Before yes. before I take the question, can I can I just like ask Chris if it is possible uh, to share the slides of your talk because one of the participants was asking. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. If if you can share with me later on by email, I'll I'll just pass that to interest interested people. Yep, happy to do so. First, I'd like to say thank you, Chris. That was very interesting. I learned a lot. And I uh, have a lot to take back to my faculty and discuss. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my question, you the first thing you did was to evaluate your program under those factors. And then where did you, what was your next step? Like, what was your first move? Like, what did you tackle first from that list there? I think course coordination was the one that was the thorniest issue. So we, the, we had the task force formed. So the task force wasn't charged with evaluating it's sort of like like internally we have an executive committee we have the department chair and associate chairs and so we took a look at our program we said like folks we are we are falling short here and so we did we formed the task force to help develop strategies to to address those and really the task force was our first starting point and the and the first thing that the task force tackled was of course coordination um and we realized that that having a wild wild west system while potentially like faculty members felt like good because like I'm really in charge of my own course. It's bad for students and it's actually bad for faculty. So let me tell you why I think it's bad for students. Suppose I'm a, a first year engineering student and I'm sharing a dorm with my other, my other fellow engineering students and we're in different classes. We can't study together. We can't, we can't talk about homework problems together. We can't share ideas and strategies. We can't build community around academics. And one of the things that we know from work of Tinto and others is that students have persistence, better persistence in academics when there's a blend between their social and academic selves. So when they see they identify personally um, with others who identify in this particular academic domain, they're more likely to persist. So this is bad for students to have a lack of uniform. And I think it's bad for faculty because it inhibits our ability to talk to each other about content, about strategies for teaching thorny ideas for good homework problems. So if we're all using the same textbook and the same general syllabus, then we can have conversations about like, oh, really, I found these problems really challenging for students and here's why, or the students really were successful in these kind of problems that we're all sharing. So there's, there's reasons for us to talk about, about teaching when we have the same textbook material. So I, I think course coordination, when it's done well, can benefit faculty, it can benefit students. And, and again, I wanna emphasize that Course coordination does not mean you're telling people how to teach. You're supporting people in a community of practice to be the best instructors they can be. And we have to take that perspective to course coordination. Um, otherwise, it's going to fail. We can't have any course coordination come in and say, like, okay, you're going to teach it this way. Here's your worksheet. Go for it. That, that, you know, let's, just, let's just be clear here that the research doesn't support that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Any questions to the speakers? Yes, Robin. Hi, thank you. Um, what is the lowest level of math course that San Diego State offers at this time? Yeah, um, it is now college algebra, which um, is not intended to be a, a precursor to precalculus. So if you need a math credit and you're the journalist major, um, we have a college algebra course and it's, it's designed primarily for like um, math for life. And so there's like interesting mathematics in there. It's a new course we developed pre-pandemic and it was in response to the uh, executive order in California that you do away with all developmental math courses. Okay. So California was part of the systems where like 
if you can't, you can, you cannot offer non-credit bearing courses. If you, any math course you have, to, it has to be credit bearing. Right. Um, and you know, it was, it's, it's an issue of, of, of equity because um, students from under-resourced schools are predominantly getting put into those developmental math courses and are just getting behind, getting behind, more behind. So it's a, it's a matter of trying to level the playing field. Okay. Do you also have math education based courses in your department? Uh, we do. We have um, we're six math ed in, in our department, and we we teach the math content courses for future high school teachers. We also have graduate programs in um, masters and PhD programs where we have um, learning theories. We have research seminars on uh, undergraduate math ed. We have a, a course on equity and social justice in math ed. So we offer a range of graduate level math ed courses. We also we also have um, uh, graduate level math courses that we teach the math ed faculty. So, for instance, I'm teaching a chaos and fractals course this semester for our master's students. So, um, our math ed faculty um, we don't we don't teach any of the teacher credential courses. All the teacher credential is in the College of Education. Yeah. So um, we don't we don't visit school systems. We don't supervise teachers on the practicum, but we do the the content courses. Okay. And you do the coordinating across the board of all your courses? Or did you just start on a smaller level and hope to increase it to all? Yeah, we're, we're um, coming out of the pandemic, things really kind of fell apart, um, okay. probably not surprisingly. And <laughs> we've got, we've got um, a new initiative that we're cooking up with our, one of our associate vice presidents. She, um, she's really concerned about the pre-engineering majors and she's got really good data that there's a problem here. And so we're gonna be uh, developing a new set of course coordinations between our, our our college algebra and our pre-calc and our calc one calc two um in particular we've got our fingers across that we're going to be able to hire two professors of practice and those professors of practice that's going to be their jam is really sort of making these courses work um so stay tuned we hope to have a job announcement all this depends on the provost saying yes um we don't we don't have a history at san Diego state of having professors of practice um okay. we hope to all right thank you uh, Chris, I have a question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so I was reading this uh, long insights of MAA survey, and it was wonderful. Uh, it was published, I think, six years ago. Am I correct? Oh, the book, the MAA insights? Yeah, about six years ago, right. My first question is, like, are you, are you planning to have a newer version of that with the new data coming into your way? Because the NSF uh, grant, you said it was from 2014 to 2021. So is there going to be a new version of that coming in with, 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 with all the practices that or lessons taken, you know, with your saying? Yes. Um, there's actually two books. So one um, just came out. It's mm -hmm. um, published by the AMS. Oh. I can, I can, let me grab the chat, a chat. And there's a, another book that we just got um, submitted final chapters to the MAA it should be coming out in several months. We're hoping by math fest. So that's a series of case studies that came out of the progress to calculus grant. And the book that came out through the uh, AMS is another grant called student engagement in mathematics through an institutional network for active learning. The acronym is called Seminole. So um, let me, let me put in the chat, a link to that book that's already out. Give me a moment. I'll... Let me just follow up with another question in the meantime. Um, did, did you have sort of like any data uh, reflecting on the post COVID teaching? Um, like, like since like 2019, we, we, we were tackling with COVID and the, the teaching practices are sort of like changed. Active learning strategies are changed as well, right? So uh, is, is there any like fresh or preliminary stuff coming out of that practice in the last, from the last two years teaching experience? Um, there will be. So as part of this, this um, seminal project, this grant, uh, we are doing final site visits to um, nine, nine partner departments across the country who have been implementing changes in their pre-calc and calculus program. And so we've been studying that change process with them. And um, we are focusing our site visits this coming spring on that very question. So one of the conjectures that we have based on, we, we meet with them every month in a kind of a kind of a network improvement community model of, of seminars. And one of the conjectures that's coming out is that the departments that had robust and supportive com communities of practice around course coordination have weathered this pandemic much better than those that didn't. 
And this, this just like makes sense. She's like, oh, you actually had, starting in September, you already had a community of people that were meeting regularly, talking about issues of teaching and learning. It's built into your system now. And so when this pandemic hit, they were able to keep going in, in ways that, that others just fell apart. So we're gonna be following up on that conjecture in our case studies. Um, so, so yeah, since really we're just coming at on the other side of the, the pandemic now um, with people going back to classes and, and somewhat uh, returning. It's a super interesting question. Oh, and I put in the chat a link to the AMS bookstore with the um, the link to the, the book there. So you might be interested in that as well. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Nick. Um, um, so you briefly talked about with your change in your coordination about calculus, and I'm interested if you could share um, how it ended up in terms of what your course structure looks like. So for example, we have college algebra classes that are offered three days a week, two days a week, then there are some with support sections that meet four days a week. Then we have our calculus courses that meet three days a week with two days of a recitation. And I'm just kind of curious where you all ended up in that uh, structure of your courses. And I don't, it doesn't matter which one specifically, but. Yeah, the, the, the pre-calculus courses are taught either three days a week or two days a week in smallish sections. So they're capped at like 60 or something like that, or even 50. Um, and they're usually taught by um, advanced graduate students or our, our lecturers. And um, the college algebra is similarly structured. And there's, there are so support courses for the college algebra, but not yet for pre-calculus. So that's one of the things we'll be rolling out next year are, are these, we call them like pre-calculus 141. And so what 141X. Yep. We also don't have support courses for Calc 1 or Calc 2. And we're going to roll those out as well with our new initiative, working with our associate uh, VP. Um, and, and calculus is similarly structured to where you so we have large lectures. Typically, it's two days a week for an hour and 15 minutes. And then the discussion sections are two 50-minute sections with, with a, a, a TA. So the TA runs the full discussion session? Yeah. Or, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and the TA has um, a whole suite of active learning problems that have been developed over the years. And they, the TAs are part of this, this three-credit um, course that I mentioned their first year. So they get support in, in implementing active learning. Um, I, I, yeah, I think during the pandemic, I don't think much active learning was happening with the discussion. No, section, I mean, but, not, I yeah, don't know. Yeah, we're, my class. Yeah, we're coming out the other end just like everybody else. Right. Okay. Thank you. Just following up with uh, Nick's comment, at some point in the presentation, you mentioned about the labs. So were those different from the recitations? No. Or well, we haven't settled on a terminology, the discussion, recitation, lab. We kind of use those three words interchangeably. Um, one of the reasons that we kind of like lab is that it, it, it signals to students from the beginning that you're going to be doing things, right? If you like, if you call it a lab, you don't walk into a lab and sit and watch somebody solve problems for you. A lab is like you're, you're active, you're engaged. And so we've been using the word lab because we want to signal to students from day one that you, this is this is this is not your mother's and your father's calculus course. Any other and, and, and again, the lab, the, the move to the lab was also facilitated by the university because when we call it a lab, then we could double the number of contact hours. So it had an institutional um, benefit as well. Um, again, it, it, does, it didn't raise the credit hours. It didn't change the cost for students. It just it increased the amount of time we had with them. Yeah, Axel, your hands up. I was another follow up. Thanks, because I'm real curious about this. When whenever people talk about like coordinating courses, I think back to my time as a graduate student, where it's like, here's your syllabus, here are your exams, here's the schedule, like uniform final, we all going to get together and grade and all of that stuff. So one of the first things that comes to mind is sort of the assessment structure of classes. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that played at all uh, into like the way that you all coordinated courses or not. It did. Um, we took some lessons learned from an institution that was part of our national study, University of Illinois Chicago, and they were using Gradescope. And we, we I never heard about it before. And like all of a sudden, we had this, this uh, uh, software that we could use that would facilitate uniform fair grading. 
So like you get together, there's like the grading parties in grad school, like everyone grades number one, you have pizza. Well, now with Gradescope, you can do it so much faster and so much more effectively because you're, you, you, you end up having the same kind of comments over and over again. And this pre-populates that comment for you when you start typing it. Um, and there's another um, Gradescope, there's another one, um, I forgot the name of it, but um, yeah. So that was a that was a uh, very helpful move. We also have been using um, some online homework systems, which you know students have mixed feelings with, but you know it's it's helpful practice, and it, you do have to be careful that that those tend not to be very conceptually oriented those um, web work problems, but they have their role. Um, yeah, and so and so some of that assessment was part of the the course coordination. I think. Um, Cal State East Bay is a really good example. It's one of our partners that we've been working with, and they developed something called a, a, a dynamic calendar. And it's basically a really fancy set of Google Docs where you can go as an instructor, you go on there and you like click on all these different active learning resources. If you want to get tips or you want to get videos or supports, I mean, it's just a really amazing resource that's that's ready at hand for anybody teaching the courses. And, and so, um, that has really facilitated their communities of practice around, around course coordination. I'm curious a little bit more about the, the grading, because I, I also never heard of grade scope and things and like pre-populating comments. I was curious a little bit about like with a lot of people picking up like standards or mastery-based grading versus like classic points, would like grade scope, if we if like for some sort of common assessment structures and things, would that be set up to kind of do a mix of both? Or is it is there anything out there that would support a mix of both? I'm just I guess personal curiosity for an institution if we were going that direction question. Yeah, I think I have to punt on that. I don't I'm I'm not I'm not well versed in mastery grading. I, I know what it is. And um I think to me it sounds scary. <laughs> I, I'm kind of afraid of it. And so I, I I think I have to punt on that. I I really don't don't have good good insight onto on how well grade scope might be useful for mastery grading. Anybody else here? Maybe there's others here that, that have that, that expertise. I'd love to hear that. Nick, you said you used it, right? Not mastery based grading. No, no. I, I share Chris's fear. Uh, <laughs> because in some ways, the way in which I view it, and this is an extra out outside perspective but in some ways I view it it's you're almost just making a translation into something else that is still going to have the similar structural problems so there is if you are interested I do know that Primus had a special issue on the whole topic and if you're interested you can go check out that special issue from 2020 I think oh yeah that's good and also um we um have a three-part Primus special issue on departments in the process of change so um if you're interested, there's the, the East Bay story is there, uh, the Fullerton story is there, University of Illinois Chicago story, whole slew of, of stories that we have. We originally um, went to Primus and we said, hey, we'd like to have a special issue focusing on our grant uh, departments that have been working on changing their pre-calc and calculus. And the editor said, that's great, but we want you to open it up to the rest of the country. So we, we did, we put out a call and we got, we got a ton of papers. And so they ended up saying, okay, you can have three issues. So we have a triple issue on stories of departments in the process of change. So we really wanted to focus not like retrospectively, but like, what are you doing when well, you're in the midst of it now? Tell us your stories. And so um, if you're interested, I would encourage you to read those, those Primus articles as well. Chris, there's a question for you in the chat. Can someone define mastery-based grading for me? Yeah, Nick, can you do that while I look for this uh, Primus article? <laughs> It's not going to be the most formal definition, but essentially, rather than creating a course structure where you have 50% from exams, some percentage from homework and some percentage from something else, whatever it may be, you set up a set of standards, which essentially are your learning goals for the course. And you have to expound on them than the seven that you would put in your syllabus, but you define what each of those particular content areas are for your course and what it means to be successful at that particular content area. And then essentially it's either, it's some ways in which you can do it is have you mastered it or have you not? And there's a lot of revision in a system like that where you, um, a student can present in some different way 
that they have mastered a topic and then they can move on to the next one or, and it's very iterative or they get other attempts to continue to master that topic. And then, and then it's some, this is the part that still, I'm not sure on, because at some point you still got to go into your course, your system, your university's grade system and enter a grade of A, B, C, D, F. So it still has to be translated to that in some way, but it's more of the, that approach to learning where it's based on the standards and learning outcomes rather than percentage of scores. Right. So students get multiple attempts to show that they've they've um, achieved a certain degree of understanding of particular ideas. Which kind of reflects how actually learning happens. It's sort of like so it, what scares me about it is that all the grading, because not only do I have to grade once, I have to grade multiple times. And so um, yeah, that's part scares me. I did I, I did something like that. Early on in my career, I, I teach a Euclidean, non-Euclidean geometry course, and I, I've been using David Henderson, who's now passed a book from Cornell, and it's very project-oriented and proof-oriented, and, and I, I started teaching that course, I didn't know it was called mastery grading, but I was doing iterations, like they would submit a proof, and I would grade and give them feedback, and they would redo it and resubmit it, and, and I mean, I got burned out, I just couldn't keep doing it, I'll tell you the truth, so, but one of the things that, that I've taken from the pandemic is that I, I still am now giving midterms and finals, but they're worth a lot less than they used to be. My midterms and finals used to be like maybe like 60% of their final grade. So I'm now thinking about, I was like, that's stupid. Why was I doing that? I mean, like, let's have a diverse way in which we're assessing students. So there's multiple measures and they can show me they've learned a lot through lots of different opportunities, not just have a high stakes midterm or high stakes final. And so I, I learned that through the pandemic and now, now my, my midterms and finals are still there, but they're not worth as much. Chris, I have a question um, of personal interest. Um, you know, we, we, again, we went through this pandemic and then we, we, we didn't know anything about Zoom before. Now everybody knows how to record lectures and so on. Um, based on your experience and your insights into that national study, I don't know if it covered or not, but what, what are your thoughts about um, video videos in general, like instructional videos supplementing, uh, let's say, calculus teaching? Like, what, what are your insights? What are the best practices in your thinking? Um, I, so just personally, I, I'm not a fan of the online classes and the Zoom and pre-recorded. Um, my, my jam is in-person interactions with students. And so um, I like to say, okay, so I had to move my differential equations class, my other classes online during the pandemic. And I had, I learned quickly how to use jam boards and to split people into groups and how to, how to have like a spy in a group where they could go to other groups. And so when I talk about it, like my own personal experience, I say, well, it didn't suck. It wasn't good, it wasn't great, it wasn't as good as face-to-face, -face, but it was okay. Like we, we managed. However, I had to, as you all did, have to do a lot of emotional caretaking for students. So people had a severe loss of community. And like being back face-to-face, -face, students are like so happy. You can almost see them smile behind their mask because they're like, finally, I get to like talk to people and see people. Um, so those online classes have some benefit especially if you're if you're in a remote area and you can't get to places so there are there are reasons for some of these online classes but um you're not going to see me moving back that direction i was more thinking about having those videos in, in a supplementary way still on a face-to-face -face setting but lots of like resources now available you know I think I think the the opportunities for people to flip their classrooms and using those some of the resources are are better now. And people have they're not so scared about doing videos. I, I have a, a colleague, uh, Regis Comorado, in, in the chemistry department. She's she's been flipping her classes now through the pandemic, and she's continuing to do it face to face. And so I think that was a really positive thing for her and some of her chemistry colleagues, where they have these huge large lectures, and they're like, "Wait a minute, we can actually do something much better if we have a little bit of the lecture devoted to offline." Um, so, um, I, I, am personally not teaching classes with huge numbers of students. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky that I get small numbers of students, either with advanced undergraduates or graduate students. So there's less of a need personally for me to flip, but I can really see the need if you're teaching huge classes of hundreds, 200 students. Um, 
and then you're right that you know having this experience now with technology people are like oh i i can do that i can actually record a lecture it's not so scary <laughs> I had a question actually, um, and I may have missed it. If so, I'm sorry. Um, I was wondering how the um, assessments had changed content wise when you introduced active learning into the classroom. Um, so depending on how you defined active learning um, with more conceptual or deeper level questioning, if that was reflected in your tests as well. Yes. Um, we're still working on that. So um, it, it is always sort of a balance. I mean, I, I think we all value procedural efficiency, procedural ability. That's a part of what's a necessary component, um, but it can't be the only component. And so um, getting good conceptual questions that are, that are gradable um, is a challenge. And also though, one of the things that we learned early on in our, our efforts at San Diego State is that if our assessments didn't reflect what was going on in the labs, the active learning labs, students didn't take the lab seriously. Like what you test is what you get. So we learned very quickly, like, holy cow, we need to have some good exam questions that are reflective of what they're doing in those active learning labs. So that was a big, I mean, it seems obvious now, but we didn't learn it the first semester. So um, yeah, that, that was the case. Um, and then I have to say, like, for me personally, I, I've now started having a, a, like a 15, 20 minute group portion of the exam. So I have a midterm, and I have a final. You're starting off the first 15, 20 minutes. You can work in your small groups on problems. You can talk about the problems. You can share insights. You can't copy each other. You know, we're monitoring that. But I, I was like, why am I not valuing that in my assessments in the, in the midterm and final when I value that so much in my classroom teaching? So that's another thing that sort of come out for me for the, from the other side of the pandemic is like, I better align my own personal assessments better with my what I value in uh, the process of learning during class. And I feel better than giving them harder questions. So if I allow them to have some group work, like I feel pretty good about letting them giving them a harder question because they get to talk about it. What's your like favorite active learning strategy in a calculus class? Hmm. Um, I, I really enjoy um, when a really interesting conceptual issue emerges from students, like a, a, a deep question, right? And then I use the, the think, pair, share strategy. Like rather than trying to answer it directly myself, I, I, I sort of like rephrase it, maybe write it on the board and say, okay, um, think about it for yourself for a moment turn to your neighbor and to talk about it, and then let's have a conversation. So for me, it's a way to take a classroom, whole class discussion and turn it sort of into like little mini group work in a very kind of quick turnaround session. And, and what it does is like just the buzz in the classroom raises so quickly. Um, so that's that's one of my, my favorite. Um, I've, also, I've also, from the pandemic, started using group roles. Um, I never used group roles. I thought it would be too kind of like, school levels like oh you feel you're treating us like middle school students giving us roles and i and i learned in the pandemic that that we all needed a little more structure and so i i started um i learned from one of our case studies in fullerton uh, roberto soto mathematician there he was using group roles years ago um before pandemic and i was, I was intriguing but i was scared to do it myself and i thought maybe it wasn't going to fit well but then i started trying it in the pandemic and i love it so I, now i have a spy so a spy is is, is licensed to go around and talk to the other students. And now I use it um, intentionally. Like I, when I see there's like some like groups aren't making progress or some groups are made two back crowds, I stop the class and say, now's a good time to send your spy around to other groups. And it's great. I mean, it's just like gets the generation going so well. And then I have a reporter. So the reporter um, is the person who's responsible for sharing out their group's work. And this helps with issues of, of equity. So it's not always the white guy that's reporting back because they have to rotate the rules, roles. And so that that like also frees me from having to worry about like, oh, did I just pick on um, this woman again here because she's always the one so smart? And like, am I always sort of privileging her voice or getting other people a voice? So having that rotating report reporter role helps me. And then um, I have this role now, it's a new role for me called a, a, a moderator. And the moderator is charged with making sure that people in their small group have a chance to talk, that their ideas are heard and no one's dominating conversation. 
So the moderator has this role of, of looking at kind of the social norms within the group. And, and we start every class and I say, all right, rotate your roles, make sure you know who, who's your, your new role leader. Um, and I never did that before the, the pandemic. And I, and I did it because, you know, people needed more structure. And I came back to face to face. I was like, that was working well. I'm going to keep doing that. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's uh, sort of another favorite new, a new twist for me for active learning. Well, sounds interesting. Thank you. Almost getting the time. So we can get one final question and then let Chris go. <laughs> well, I did put in the chat a link to the uh, introduction to the, the triple issue for Primus in case you're interested. You can easily find it there. One final question for the speaker. If there is any. Uh, Chris, uh, you mentioned Alex. What is Alex? It's a um, computerized kind of semi-smart um, assessment program. I don't know if it's an acronym or not. It's A-L-E-K-S. Um, and, and what it does is it um, you can set it up so that you have a set of randomized questions and that you'll get a score on it. And then that particular score is associated with whether or not that score is ready for you to for calculus or pre-calculus. Um, it's also set up that you can use it to help students uh, refresh and re review material. So like they do a sort of a, a pie chart and they're like, oh, you really need to sort of um, review and revise your, your understanding of topic X. And so then they'll have modules that allow students to go through that. So it's um, you know, like most of these online systems for learning, they're, they're less conceptually oriented, um, but it, we're actually finding a pretty good um, correlation with with um, Alex scores and student success in in pre calculus and calculus at San Diego State. So, a court, not perfect, but uh, it leaps and bounds better than what we had before. Hey, Chris, when did they take that, Alex? Thank you. Yes, over the summer. Okay, and we're, and we're, we're set. We're setting so it up. Ask, sorry, you said it was proctored. So, how are you guys proctoring that? Yeah, they're having to come into campus or like. They can take it a couple times uh, before on their own, and then they have to come into campus to take it proctored. So okay. students get a, a couple of chance to try it out and say like, oh gosh, I didn't get as much as I thought I could. I better, I better do some studying and some review and they can take it again. And then they come in for a, um, a proctored test. We didn't, we didn't, we weren't able to do proctored tests during the pandemic. And we're really seeing the, the, the fallout from that now. So lots of students got into Calc 1 that probably shouldn't have been in Calc 1. And our pass rate is poor right now. So we, we're, we're going back to our, our, our in-person proctoring as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah, we had a similar situation with our placement. It was unproctored during the pandemic and we are seeing, having similar results. No questions? Okay, I think uh, this makes the end of the talk. Um, uh, Chris, uh, thank you very much for coming on behalf of Siam Student Chapter of Western Kentucky University. Uh, thanks again for coming and accepting our invitation. Um, just a quick announcement before everybody goes, we have a math symposium coming up uh, in a few weeks. Uh, if you haven't submitted your abstracts, please do. <laughs> and today is the deadline. Uh, thanks again for all coming. Uh, I'm going to end the uh, uh, session. Thanks again for inviting me. I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, thanks so Chris. Thanks, Chris.